Now, if you'd like to follow along, I'm in the book of Nahum, chapter 1. Um, it's near the end of the Old Testament, before Habakkuk and Zechariah and that, and after, right after Micah. <coughs> I know that when I was looking for that book, I missed my little thumb indexes. I'm telling you that right now. I do miss them things in this new Bible. But I want to begin reading in Nahum chapter 1 and verse 1. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. God is jealous. And the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. And that's where I'm going to stop. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. This is a book of judgment. Now there are many opinions of when Nahum actually lived and he prophesied. But it doesn't really matter. Because here's the point. Nahum did live and Nahum did prophesy the word that the Lord gave him. And we've got it documented here. It's generally agreed that this comes after Jonah. We first heard of Nineveh actually in Genesis when somebody founded it. But then we hear of jo Jonah, Nineveh, being the place that Jonah did not want to go. And he went anyway. God took him there. And Jonah preached a message. And Nineveh repented. Now this is supposed to be around 100 years later. So pretty much everyone that Jonah preached to and repented is mostly gone. Guess what? Nineveh went right back to the way it was. Nineveh went right back to the way it was. And guess what? We have another prophecy here. Now as far as we can tell, especially by this book, Nahum didn't go there. He wrote this vision. And actually it says, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. He just wrote a book about it. He didn't go. Nineveh had gone back to doing what they had done before. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Assyria had come down, invaded Judah and Israel sometime in the past and had took away captive Israelites. 
Now, I'm not saying that they did it again here, but here's the thing. God, at that time, used Assyria to punish Israel. And then God holds the Assyrians accountable for exactly what they've done. Against his people. Even though it's what he wanted them to do. To teach the Israelites a lesson. Nahum received the word of the Lord and he wrote it down and he prophesied the destruction of Nineveh and Nineveh was destroyed. They say about 115 years later. But part of, Nineveh, part of Nahum's prophecy was the Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is slow to anger. And what I have to say about that is this. This is the title, Paul. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is good. Now, the world and the religious world have a tendency to misunderstand God's slowness to anger. They think because it is a slow anger that there is no anger that ain't so that's not so the scripture is clear they are wrong God is angry with the wicked every day but he says here sometimes sometimes not always but sometimes it's a slow anger you understand, God has his purpose, God has his timeline, and God's not concerned with what we think about it. Right. Don't get vexed. What was it David said in Psalm? I was envious when I saw what? The prosperity of the wicked. Until I considered their end. Just because God is slow to anger, even in my sight, doesn't mean that anger is not there. Doesn't, it doesn't mean, what is it? Their judgment doesn't slumber. Some people think there is no anger, and they think wrong. God is slow to anger. He's angry with the wicked every day. Yes. Our Lord is long-suffering even with the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And then he says this, the Lord is great in power. The Lord is good. The Lord is good because the Lord has all power. I wish I could lay a hold of that. I really wish I could. Because our Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah is called what? The Lord of hosts is his name. What's he called? The Holy One of Israel. That's his name. The Redeemer. That's his name. Now, how can he be the Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel, and the Redeemer. Well, I can tell you how. He has all power. All power. What's that mean for us and everyone else on this world? We have absolutely no power. We think we do. Oh, there's big shots, you know. They, they think they're running countries. They're not running anything. They have no power except for what the Lord has given under their hand. What? For a finite time. He's got all the power. Our Lord Jesus Christ said it himself. Matthew 28 and 18. I'm just going to read it. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying... 
all power is given unto me where? In heaven and in earth. In heaven and in earth. What's that? That's this world and everything above it. Now is that heaven up above or is that just heaven in the skies? Uh, yes. Yes. Our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said that as a man standing on this earth. He had all power in the heavens and in the earth. Oh. And if Jesus Christ has all the power, Satan has none. Except what the Lord allows him to exercise. Any power anyone else has or thinks they have is an illusion or a delusion on their part. Because I can tell you this. I know a lot is made of this. Okay? Pharaoh hardening his heart doesn't stop the one who holds the king's heart in his hand from turning it whithersoever he will. We can't stop God. I don't want to. I'm afraid sometimes I'm getting in the way. And I don't want to get in the way because he will put you out of it. Yes, he might push you down. Yes, he might knock you down. Yes, he might let Satan tempt and test and give you boils and you're sitting on top of a dung heap. Scratching your boils with the scraps of a pot. That's what he did to Job. The Lord turns that heart whithersoever he will. And then this is one of the statements that just kind of grabbed me when I was reading this. This in verse 7. The Lord will not at all acquit. And this is the wicked. And what do you say to that? Say the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Now, I noticed in verse 3 here, he says he's slow to anger and great in power and, all three of these are connected together. But it says, and will not at all acquit. And then those two words are interpolated there, the wicked. Okay? If you look back, if you want, to Exodus chapter 34, we'll find almost an exact duplicate of this. That part of it. Verse 7. Well, verse 6, I'm going to read. And the Lord passed by before him, talking about Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. And truth. In verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. And the words, two words there. The guilty are interpolated. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Upon the children's children. Unto the third and to the fourth generation. And here's the thing, after you read something like that, after Moses saw something like what happened, and Moses made haste, bowed his head toward the earth, and worshipped. Why? Because the Lord is good. In Exodus 34, 7, there's two words, the guilty are added. And here, in Nahum 1 and 3, the two words, the wicked, are added. Now, they don't need to be there. These words, and I look, these two are actually worded exactly the same. I assume Nahum was quoting Moses. But it doesn't matter. He was quoting God. Either way. Because here's the thing. The Lord will not at all acquit. He won't acquit. You understand? 
Of course he won't acquit the wicked because they're wicked. That's the, you know, it's, it's sort of like that thing, you know, all good things work together for good to them that love God. Of course all good things do. That's the way some people want to interpret that. That's not the way it is. Now, yes, the Lord is good. Yes, he is. But here's the thing. Those words are added in, and I think they're added in for us. Because we forget and sometimes don't realize that in Christ, we, believers, all the saints of God, are not wicked. Are not, from Exodus 34, guilty. We're not. And I think sometimes the religious hate this. Because here's the thing. In Jesus Christ, we are as righteous and as holy as he is. Now, yes, I'm a sinner. And yes, I sin. And yes, so do you. But in Christ, ah, in Christ, we have his righteousness imputed to each and every one of us. Amen. That's right. And you understand, in God's sight, we don't need acquittal. Yeah. We're not wicked. Right. We're not guilty anymore. Because his son took every sin. What did it say in Exodus 34? Keeping mercy for thousands, what? Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And he won't clear the guilty. He will not clear the guilty. He will not acquit the wicked. Why? Because we're forgiven. We're not guilty anymore. You understand? There was a debt we owed. There was a penalty we were due. And the penalty for sin is death. And Jesus Christ paid that penalty as a substitute for every one of his children. God's not going to quit us. We're not guilty. I like, you know why? Because the Lord is good. The Lord is good. I'll even say it in the personal form if you want. Because if you believe and trust God, feel free to do the same. I don't need to be acquitted. I have the righteousness of God in Christ in me right now. How did that get there? Oh, but of God. Are ye in Christ Jesus? And didn't stop there. Although that's glorious right there as it is. I mean, that's one of the most glorious statements in the world. Of God are ye in Christ Jesus. Not of your will, not of your flesh, not of your running. Not of any of your deeds. Of God are ye in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus who is made unto us. Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. If you believe and trust in Christ, you don't need to be acquitted. You're forgiven. What? Transgressions, your iniquities, and your sin. That's all three. And everything in between. Our sin debt is paid in full because our Lord paid it in full. He died the death that we couldn't die and survive. Yeah. <laughs> we could die, but we wouldn't survive. And we could die, and it wouldn't satisfy God. And that is who has to be satisfied. 
And there is no forgiveness of any kind without the punishment of sin and transgression and iniquities. Our sin debt was paid in full and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to us what? by God. Amen. You know? <clears throat> Believers are not going about to establish their own righteousness. Believers have been given the righteousness of Christ. The Lord is good. And if you want to, you can read the rest of this verse, the rest of this whole book. He rebuketh the sea, the Lord is good. And maketh it dry, the Lord is good. And drieth up all the rivers, Bashan languisheth in Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth, the Lord is good. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt. The earth is born, burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? The Lord is good. His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good. And that's what he says in verse 7. It just seems like a really strange verse to throw right in the middle of this chapter. Right in the middle of this beginning of harshness. Because never forget, no matter what is going on, no matter where it is going on, the Lord is good. Yeah. The Lord is good. Say, how often is the Lord good? Always. Always. Because understand, the Lord is good, just as good in Nahum 1 through 6, verse chapter 1 and 1 through 6, as he is in chapter 7. I mean, verse 7, excuse me. He's just the same. Everything the Lord does is good. You know why? Because if the Lord does it, it's good. Whether you understand it or not. Whether you like it or not. Whether you feel that it's good or not. The Lord is always good. Walter's been preaching about Joseph. And through that whole thing, I love the story of Joseph. I love that thing. It's great. Joseph was hated by his brothers in the beginning of his account. Why? It doesn't matter why. But I can tell you this, Joseph spoke the truth and his brothers hated him. And guess what? The Lord is good. When your brother hates you, the Lord is good. When your brother loves you, the Lord is good. And Joseph went through all that. He was, he was dropped into a pit. Now Reuben was going to sneak back and get him out of that pit just to sort of maybe teach him a lesson. Guess what? Somebody else done took him out of that pit and down toward Egypt before Reuben ever got there. And guess what? The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him and lied about him to her husband. He's thrown in prison. He's been, he's been a prisoner and a slave ever since his brother's thrown him in the pit. And guess what? The Lord is good. Amen. And not only that, he tells us at the end, Walter talked about it. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Yeah. Now you understand, God didn't turn it for good. The Lord was good all along. Right. Amen. Right. And God meant it for good all along. And you'll read in there of Joseph being the Savior of Egypt and his brethren, the Hebrews. Why? Because the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Now, 
Was Joseph bothered by some of these things? Did he suffer some things as a slave and as a prisoner? Yes. I'm sure he did. And he may have even thought, why in the world am I in this mess? But here's the answer. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. You start thinking about where you are and what's going on in your life and with your family. I said this years ago and I'll stick by it. If I ever sit down and try to explain my brothers and sisters and their spouses and ex-spouses and more spouses and whatever else and their kids and everything else is going on, trust me, my life would sound like a soap opera. You know what? Through the whole thing, the Lord is good. Whether I know it or not. Whether it bothers me or not, Walter. Whether it vexes my soul, Mason. Paul, when I think I'm up to here, trust me, I'm not even close. The Lord is good. He's good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. I'll ask you this question. When is God a stronghold? Ah, it says right here, in a day of trouble. That ain't right. It's partially right, but it, the Lord's always a stronghold. Amen. It's just you don't notice it until the day of trouble. Right. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm just pointing you. I don't notice it until the day of trouble. When everything's going fine, I'm fine. But you understand, if the Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble, the Lord is a stronghold all the time. Because our God changeth not. The Lord is never weak. He's never looking the other way while something is bothering you. That's the way a lot of people preach it. Well, brother, you'd be better if you just prayed more. I wish I knew how to pray because I'd pray him away for saying stuff like that. You understand, God never takes his eye off the what? The apple of his eye. He's looking at us. He's seeing his son. The son is the apple of his eye. And guess where we are? In him. His eye is never not on us. That's a double negative, I suppose. His eye is always on us. Why? Because the Lord is good. And he's a stronghold in the day of trouble, and that's when you'll realize it. But listen, folks, there was a hedge around Job before Satan ever showed up in heaven talking to God. He told God, you've got a hedge around him that I can't touch him. Job wasn't in trouble. That changed. And you know what? The hedge changed, but there was still a hedge. You know why? Because the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord never leaves his saints, his brethren, alone. Ever. Oh, we may feel alone. We may feel undefended. We may even feel deserted. And we are wrong. We are wrong. You can't trust your feelings. Remember, the Lord is good whether you feel it or not. The Lord is good whether you think so or not. And the Lord is good whether you want him to be or not. And he never leaves a child of his unattended. In the last statement, he knoweth them that trust in him. 
You understand, we've gone through all this. God is jealous. God, the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. And he knows them that trust him. God is good. The Lord is good. He knows them that trust in him. And very simple thought here. The order that it's stated in. He knows them that trust him. It's not they trust him and then he knows. That's the way it's preached. That's the way it's preached. That's wrong. He knows them before they trust him. You understand? Our God changes not. What he knows now, he knew way forever. And in what he's going to know in the future, he knows now. And the Lord, here's the thing, the Lord knows them. He knows them. You understand? Every saint of God is known by God personally. Personally. He knows them. He has an intimate relationship with those that trust God him because who the Lord knows he has always known and I can tell you this as a fact there is no person who truly trusts God without God's knowing them first Amen. That's right. Right. Yeah. he chose his people in his son the Lord Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world if you got a problem with that you got a problem with the book because that's what it says I can't I can't help you if you got a problem with the, the book if you got a problem with God's word guess what it's your problem it used to be my problem thank God by his grace and hopefully his continuing grace, his word's not a problem for me anymore. I recognize I'm the problem, not him. What does it say? By faith, the just live. Faith, his gift by grace to those whom he has given life by the power of his voice. Behold, there's a day coming and now is when the dead in Christ the dead, excuse me, shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Amen. Shall live. And that's talking about us spiritually dead, walking around in this world, physically alive. He deals with the dead in the grave a couple of verses later, and I'm not going into that. He gives life, and he gives faith, and guess what? We trust him. He sends his word. He sends a man. Some way, some shape, somehow. Yes, he does. We have the words of men right here in this book. That's right. Men who trusted him. Men who trusted him enough to put down their fallacies and other people's fallacies as well as their triumphs as people look at them. Because he knows them that trust him because he has made them to know him. Nobody knows God without God. I know that kind of sounds a little silly, but that's the way it is. It's just not that that sounds, it's that we're silly. There's no way to know God without God revealing himself to you. There's no way to trust God without the power of God. So in conclusion, the Lord is good. That's it. Just remember that. Try and keep it in your head. I mean, this is... <laughs> whatever the Lord does... Is good. 
You understand? The flood came and killed all that had breath in their nostrils. Except the eight souls by water and whoever, whatever was in the ark. And the Lord is good. The Lord destro destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with brimstone and fire from the sky. And the Lord is good. The Lord spared Lot and his two daughters. And the Lord is good. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. It's not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. The Lord is good. Wait a minute. The Lord makes one vessel unto honor and another vessel to dishonor what? out of the same lump. And the Lord is good. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. What? Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And they deny both God and Christ. And the Lord is good. Our thoughts... Our emotions, our feelings, our desires, our wants, never change God. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And man doesn't get to pick and choose what he wants from the scripture. Because the Lord is good. I don't understand. It's okay. The Lord is good. I don't like it. I know. I know lots of people don't like it. But the Lord's still good. Like it or not. Aren't there evil acts? Yes, there are. And the Lord is good. Aren't there evil men? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Never forget this. It is all things that work together for good to them that love God who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. Trust him. Salvation is of the Lord. The Lord is good. Trust him. Jesus Christ saves sinners. The Lord is good. Believe him. Praise his holy name. For the Lord is always good. Believe him. Trust him. And love him. He is working everything out the way he wants. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And the Lord is good. Rejoice. Take comfort in him. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. We don't. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time, this place. And we are very thankful, Lord, that you are good. And you have done everything for us in your Son, whose name mm, blesses our souls. Savior, Redeemer, Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.